My name is Andy, and I film the videos at The Imperfects. I'm the son of English immigrants, and I am grateful to call Australia home. We at The Imperfects acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast was recorded, and extend our respects to their elders past and present. I am inspired by the strength and endurance of the world's oldest living culture, and we draw on and pay homage to their traditions of story when we share stories on our podcast. The Imperfects is not a licensed mental health service and is not a substitute for professional mental health advice, treatment or assessment. The advice given in this episode is general in nature, but if you're struggling, please see a healthcare professional or call Lifeline on 13114. Quick, is anyone here a doctor? Yes, her name is Dr. Emily and she's a psychologist. Please welcome to The Imperfects, our very own psychologist. This is, this, um, it's exciting to have Emily back. Dr. M. Hello, Dr. M. Hello, everyone. This particular episode, because I know what you're going to be talking about, uh-huh. I I don't think I've ever been as excited for a Dr. M as I am this one. Whoa. What have you got against social chit-chat at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> you just keep diving straight into the topic. <laughs> no, no, no. I just wanted to, that, that's, um, it's just on my mind, wanted to get it out. We okay. can, we can, we can riff off the back of that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like everyone just wants to know what the topic is now and then we should just start, but I... No, it's just a little tease. Mm. Okay. It's a, yeah, it's um, a broadcasting tease. technique. Look it's it up. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> I will, mate. Um, well, I, I did think of something just like slightly amusing off the back of what just happened before we went to uh, before we turned on the mics. Oh, Can I that, share? Something I love more than slightly amusing <laughs> anecdotes. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I thought was Em would love this slightly amusing anecdote, so I'll share it very quickly. Yeah. Well, just the reason it came up was that you asked if you had anything in your teeth and I nearly went to get it out for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when I was a teacher, there was a, another teacher and she worked um, in the library and me and a friend of mine always noticed around holiday time she'd get really particularly down. Mm. And so we used to just go and visit her a lot just before holidays because well, we always felt like maybe school was her connection. That's where she just loved being around people and the holidays maybe she didn't have too many people in her life. So we used to go and see her all the time um, before holidays. Anyway, this one particular time we went down to chat to her just at lunchtime and she was eating uh, a sandwich and I said something to her that made her laugh a lot at a very inopportune moment because her mouth was completely full of sandwich. And as I said in the laugh, she did this laugh where she went, mm. she tried to keep her food in, but she went <laughs> like that and food just went flying <laughs> everywhere. Like a, it looked like a sprinkler of chewed up sandwich just going everywhere. Like and the Bellagio was, fountains. Yes, like that of, yeah. of sandwich. And I was looking straight at her, I was about a <laughs> metre away. This. And it landed, like a bit of sandwich landed straight on my lip, like drink on my lip. And oh. I could see her going, oh, I got him. And I was going, nope, she got me. But it's not something you talk about. And as has this, uh, I was like, we just, it was just really awkward. And I was like, I get, I got to get rid of this. And then just out of nowhere, like my tongue was just like, I got this. And my oh. tongue just like, I just licked it off my lips and, oh. and I ate it. <laughs> Wow! My t- I was like, I didn't, I didn't go. I, I know what to do. My tongue just, it took over. My tongue just did it. I didn't say, I didn't say, I know how to do this. I'll get my tongue. To, my tongue just went. I got it. Did and she notice? It yeah, she noticed, and we never, t- we never really talked ever again. <laughs> it was so. Never spoke again about anything. She looked so disgusted in me, and I looked a bit disgusted in myself, and I sort of. Traced off and just thought, oh, well, God, that's imb- that's awkward. What was, can I, um, just to break it down a little bit. Um, Lettuce, tomato. No, no. What was the time, the time it took okay. between it landing on your lip and your tongue grabbing it? Uh, impact to lick off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was, was, was probably about five to seven seconds. So it's a just, long time. It so just sat there and I, I was just becoming, it was heavy as well. It was a lot of food. Heavy. How just, big? <laughs> how big in, talking in centimetres? It was probably half a five cent piece. Oh, no, okay. no, hey, no, that's huge too. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty big. Yeah, it's probably the size of, it was probably the size of a sultana. Okay. And I was just sitting there and I was like, I, I, I thought I didn't want to wipe it with my hand because if I wiped it with my hand, looking back on it, it happened a long time. If it wiping with my hand would have meant... We'd both see it and both have to go, oh, it's happened. It's yeah. embarrassing. But with my tongue, I think my brain just went, you could whip it away with your tongue and she'll never notice. Yeah. <laughs> but she was just staring at this sultana-sized bit of 
masticated um, sandwich. So this is obviously before <laughs> you were doing intermittent fasting. <laughs> yes, because I would not have <laughs> break the fast. <laughs> yeah. That much food, yeah, it would have. God, just, oh, wow, yeah, huge. it's still one of the most awkward moments of my entire life. And we just we would see each other from time to time and just go. Was it hey, just hey. was the other guy there as well? You, or person? Girl, girl uh, yeah, went? she was, but she didn't see it because okay. she, she, she saw the food go everywhere. Okay. And then I told her what had happened afterwards, and she said, "You are the strangest person <laughs> yeah. I have ever met." <laughs> Took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Wow, Hugh. Yeah, anyway. Oh, God. I just, I'm fantastic. feeling for our producer, uh, Bridget, who gets a bit queasy with these kind of stories. Yeah. Are you still with us, Bridget? <laughs> she almost vomited. God, fantastic, Hugh. Yeah, anyway. Anyway, back to the issue at hand. Um, Dr. M. <laughs> there is a huge chance that we will not play that. I'd be surprised if that came out. Yeah. <laughs> and then we've got no small talk. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Dr. M. Every month, you obviously come onto the show. You bring with us some sort of wisdom uh, from your psychologist knowledge bank. What is it today? I know what it is, but just speaking on behalf of the audience. Gosh, I feel there's a bit of a build up to this one. Um, and I don't want to say it specifically yet, um, but I just wanted to mm. first of all mention that I'm not actually. M knows the radio techniques. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. she's, 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 she's well. looked it up. She's, in the, she's looked it up. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also wanted to mention that I'm not bringing in a particular episode to reference back because yeah. it actually feels like this topic is probably tying into almost every single one of the episodes that you know that is out there already. So this is more kind of like a broad concept um, that will have relevance to all of them, I think. Yeah, a universally relatable topic. Yeah, exactly. Love it. So what I'm broadly talking about today is positive psychology. And there's, um, there's a whole lot of different ways in which we can define positive psychology. It's a huge area of research, particularly in the last kind of 20 years. But there's a particular um, professor who really, I think, sums up positive psychology. And he sums it up and he says this in his lectures. He sums it up in three words. Other people matter. Mm, it's the best. And what he proposes is that if we look at what kind of the meaning is of positive psychology, it's kind of this scientific study of, of what makes life worth living. And he says it's other people and that other people matter. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Well, thanks for coming in, Em. Yeah. That's yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the reason I'm so excited about this topic uh, is I've done like a, a, an afternoon's worth of research on this um, a while ago because early on when I was seeing psychologists I've seen over the years and Josh, you have as well, um, she introduced me to this concept. And so the professor I think you're talking about is Dr. Christo Christopher Peterson. Mm -hmm. Uh, from America is a, a university professor and he sort of like known, I think as sort of one of the like, sort of fathers of positive psychology, sadly passed away now. Uh, but he w seemed to be like a real pioneer and front runner in, in setting the, you know, he wrote a lot about positive psychology. And then I heard this story about it, which was that he was, he'd been lecturing for years I uh, talked a lot about positive psychology, thought a lot about it, and he was going to write a paper, like this huge, I guess, I don't know, would it be like a thesis or a paper? Mm -hmm. What would you call it, Em? Like, some like sort a dissertation of, or sure. meta-analysis? Dissertation, okay. essay, yeah. something, yeah. <laughs> a, 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 on the topic of like what makes us happy. Like That was the, the, this broad, big topic. But because he was who he was and he'd done all the research he'd done, the entire maybe entire positive psychology community or psychology community was really excited to find out what he, to read his paper. And so he'd spent years researching this. He'd interviewed like thousands of people and like read lots of stuff, written lots of stuff. So what he was going to say about it was important. And finally it was coming time for him to publish and everyone was really excited to read this paper. And he only published the three words, other people matter. Awesome. Mm. And I think, I mean, there's there's so much that sits underneath that statement, really. You know, it, it's in some ways obviously such a simple statement, but it really hits at the core of what makes life worth living, really, mm -hmm. is our sense of connection and connectedness with other people. Mm -hmm. Maybe actually it's probably worth even mentioning what maybe some of the misconceptions are about positive psychology. And I first really want to emphasise that 
positive psychology is not positive thinking. It's not about um, being positive. It's not about, you know, gritting your teeth, smiling through something. Mm. It's a much, um, it's actually kind of, you know, kind of in some ways unrelated to that, but it is the study of positive emotions. It's the study of traits and states that elicit um, positive experiences and positive emotions. It's also the study of institutions that promote well-being. And, but all of that, all of that stuff that, that sits there is held by how we relate to how we connect with and how we care for and show up to mm. other people. I feel like I've heard once that it comes from that previously to this, a lot of psychology was focusing on what could be perceived as negative mm -hmm. diagnosis deficits. and yes, deficits. Uh, and then this was the first time that there was a directed yeah. attention into what we'd call positive um, character traits. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And in fact, it was the kind of, mm, I would say maybe one of the founders or the, the primary founder was Martin Seligman. Oh, yeah. um, and he his research, his initial research was actually on learned helplessness, which is a feature and aspect experience in depression. Okay. And so it really, you know, the... The main research, you know, probably up until the 90s was around kind of this medical illness model. So mm. coming from a place of scarcity or a place of lacking, a place of deficit, um, a place of illness. So all approaches to therapy and to psychology were really around how do we get someone functioning from a place of ill health to a place of normal yeah. functioning. Whereas positive psychology, it, it actually moves into a, like a really different sphere of functioning. And interestingly, it was Martin Seligman that moved from learned helplessness and the study of kind of ill health actually into the study of well-being and flourishing and oh, um, hmm. optimism. Yeah, okay. Um, so it went from learned helplessness into almost learned optimism. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, and so he was kind of the, the, the founder in some ways of this movement towards looking at how we flourish, how we experience vitality, how we experience like a life worth living. And Christopher Peterson was one of his colleagues and they, they've written quite a few papers together actually. Mm. Um, and it was the, their work together that looked at things like character traits. So the, the virtues or the character strengths that I have that promote well-being and promote happiness, promote resilience, um, those sorts of things. So did Seligman just have a much better PR team because he certainly is more out there than Yeah, Peterson. he's he's well he's definitely very well known also because he at I think in the late 90s became the president of the um the APA which is the, mm. the American Psychological, Psychological Association. Association. Yeah. 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 Um and so he you know he obviously he was really um he was much more well um publicized. Um but also you know really sadly Christopher Peterson passed away in 2012 and so you know the the capacity for us to know more of Peterson's work is so limited because, you know, he hasn't been able to continue his work. Mm. But Seligman still, you know, is very much, you know, in, in the world of positive psychology and producing a lot of really interesting and important kind of research. Yeah. Wow. It's, I mean, it's kind of, I think it's well described as the science of flourishing, really, like the, mm. because I think a lot of before positive psychology, it was when you went to a psychologist, you were assessed on a scale of, I think it was zero to negative five. Is that right? And and mm. um, and then Sullivan said, well, let's have a plus, like rather than getting people to zero, let's get them to flourish. Let's get them beyond neutral or whatever you want to call it and get them to this positive place mm -hmm. of flourishing. Absolutely. And I think it really importantly in there that it's not just about happiness, because if we, if we think of happiness it's one measure of experience, but also happiness is a state. So it's a it's an emotion that that like any other emotion comes and goes. So we don't want to use that as the hallmark of a life worth living, mm -hmm. is because it's a it's a transitory st emotional state. Um, yeah. So there are these other markers of of what actually Peterson calls the good life, um, and they're probably some of the things that we might talk about a little bit today. Mm, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah because it. More and more you do realise the more you hear, read about things or hear people talk about this stuff is that you realise that this, the pursuit of happiness as like a goal in life is, does not make sense. Mm -hmm. No. You can't mm -hmm. be happy all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I'm also struck by that thing. I don't know who said it, but that fun is only fun because it stops. 
Oh, like, that's good. Nothing, hmm. anything you can think of that's fun. If I told you you're going to do that for the rest of your life nonstop becomes yeah awful. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, true. and I think it's similar with happiness. Mm. Like happiness is only happiness because it stops. Yeah. Do you guys have anything coming to your head then that would be like Tiggy? <laughs> <laughs> I thought of the ball pit at IKEA. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is only fun because it stops. <laughs> <laughs> Tiggy. <laughs> Uh, yes. Okay. So there, I mean, there are so many researchers in this area um, that are producing something like such interesting and really important work. Mm. But if we come back to this kind of core theme around other people matter, you know, really what Peterson's saying in there is that all the things that that create or foster or cultivate this life that's worth living involve other people usually. And I just want to start off with one kind of area, and that is the area of um, of pleasurable experience and celebration. And so I want you to think about, you know, when you think of maybe like a recent pleasurable experience, how often are those experiences in solitude or how often are they in the company of other people? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm, I'm, the first thing that comes to mind is our live tour, mm. the, the, our Imperfects stage tour that, we've, that we did earlier in the year. And we'll continue to do, um, but it's that is, and I've often thought this that live performing doesn't really interest me on my own because I think that I I I, I find it hard to see the joy in that. Mm. I greatly admire solo performers like stand-up comedians, and I just think it it's incredible because it's it would be so hard. And I think the reason for me, the reason I think it would be so hard is because in success or in failure it's hard to find joy in it. I did a, I did a show a couple of years, like just before COVID with a few friends. It was called Dave's Shed Show, which was a, a like a live, it was a web, a, like a, Dave Lawson hosted it. And it was like a web show that we did live at the comedy festival for a few nights. And I remember there was a performer, a stand-up just before us in the venue we were at and she was killing out, you know, she was getting so many laughs and then she because we were waiting in the wings to set up our show once she finished and the audience left. She came off to like, you know, huge applause and laughter and everyone just loved her. She's hilarious. And she came back and there was no one there back there that she was with because she's just, she's a stand up. And so she went back, uh, like waved and it was high energy. But then as soon as she came back, she's a, you know, like a professional comedian. So the energy just drops, checks her phone, grabs her bag and then, and then that was it. Like she's done. She mm-hmm. leaves. And certainly not to to criticize that way of working. Like that, it works for so many people. But for me, I would find that really tough because she was, it was such a successful show and she didn't look like, she had no one to go back and celebrate with mm-hmm. essentially. Mm-hmm. Whereas mean- when we... Yeah, well, that's what you you did that, for so long. I, yeah. I, I've lived both and I the diff, mm-hmm. like, you know, mm-hmm. for many years... You know, I, I think the example I gave is Adelaide Entertainment Centre was the last one I did last year. It's like 2,000 people there and it was such a great night. Literally 15 minutes after the show finished, I'm sitting on my hotel bed by myself just going, okay, guess I'll uh, go to sleep. Yeah, And it's mm. like you feel really because mm-hmm. you've had 2,000 people loving mm-hmm. it and then you by yourself it feels extremely lonely. Mm. And now we do this live show and it's just like we're hugging afterwards, like the four of mm. us are hugging after we finish and mm. – we get to t- and and actually someone who um, who had been meeting the audience after and someone said to me, "What's your favourite part of the show?" And I thought f- for a second and I said, "You know, my favourite part is when I'm off the stage and I'm watching Josh perform or I'm watching Ryan perform. That's my favourite part. Watching the others mm. do their thing. I, I love it. Like it's such a lovely moment. Not so. Yeah, it's it. I couldn't. Mm. Um, that resonates with me so strongly. Mm-hmm. Yeah." Uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just uh, greatly disagree with what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. my favourite part is when I perform. <laughs> no. um, but I think that, I mean, both of those examples are, so, I mean, so important and that is that it's in the company of others that we can really savour and experience pleasure. Um, you know, a similar example came to my mind. I remember when I finished, I had finished my PhD and I handed it in at the desk of the, mm. like the university yeah. desk. Mm. And I was on my own, which was probably in hindsight a silly idea, but I handed it in. This is like this piece of work I'd worked on for so long. I handed it in and the woman that received it was like, thank you. 
And she just oh. turned around and walked away. And yeah. I remember standing there going, oh, this is. What do you mean, thank you? So <laughs> then I got in the lift and I pressed the button and I was like, oh, okay. Guess that's, that's it. That's done then. Um, but it was when I went out for dinner with my parents that night where there was this moment to savour mm. the celebration of this achievement. But that sense of achievement and accomplishment and pride and, and gratitude and all those sorts of you know, pleasant experiences or emotions would not have been there in the absence of someone to witness them. Yeah. Mm. Um, and this is really kind of, you know, for me, I think really fundamental when it comes to the importance of celebration um, and celebrating other people's successes mm. because it fosters connection. Mm. Um, does that kind of resonate with you? Yep. Absolutely. The the thing I'm, I don't know why my mind went here, but whenever you, I'm having, like if I'm having fun by myself, like if I see something that I find funny on like a YouTube video or something I find funny, the immediate feeling is I want to share this mm. with mm-hmm. people and send it around to people. Similarly, similar, sim, sim, similarly, no. similarly, <laughs> similarly, similarly, <laughs> similarly, what a funny word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, When I am, say, experiencing something that's fun with either out by myself or with uh, one of my kids, the the desire to take a photo of it and share it is kind of pretty quick because I want to share that experience of joy Mm. and fun. And I just wonder if the whole like social media thing of like it becomes about projecting a life that you're not potentially living. But I feel like if it does it have a much more innocent uh, acorn where it began of just like I want to share this joy mm. with other people. Mm. And I think that's a really great question, and I think that, you know to me the thing that first hits me is that there is this natural instinct we have to connect and to share. Mm. Um, and so you're sharing something that's really important to you, and it's almost like if there's no one here to witness this experience, is this not as meaningful? Yeah. Yeah, which is kind of the – and then people turn to the cliche of like if you didn't take a photo of it, did it really happen mm. is like the sort of joke. But it kind of feels like there's more truth to it mm-hmm. that if I if only I experienced this, did it really happen? Mm. Well, yeah. it makes sense if you think about it in, without getting too cynical, but it makes sense that a company would see – would be able to observe something that is so important to us as humans, which is the need to share a, a happy moment mm. with friends – and monetize com- it. commercialize it. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, of course, like it, yeah. it makes complete sense as to why why they would want to do that because mm-hmm. it's obviously worked. Yeah. It's one of those things that seems obvious to, when I think, but it just never occurred to look no. at it from that angle yeah. before for me. Mm, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, continue. Sorry to digress. <laughs> um, but there is, there is a really, um, a really lovely piece of research that has come from Peterson's work, actually, although it wasn't actually him that did this research, but he was reporting on it. Um, to do with celebration and to do with connection. And he cites this research that was done by Krauss and colleagues in 2010, and it was looking at basically kind of the determinants of of performance, of, of work performance or good performance. And he studied, or the, the team studied NBA and mm. in the 2008-2009 NBA season, and what their intention was to look at predictors of performance across the season – through kind of two factors being trust and cooperation, but that there was an element in there that would facilitate trust and cooperation that would then lead to high performance, and that was physical touch in celebration. Whoa. So what the team did was they coded, and this was really robust research too, they coded, they watched the whole season and they coded. Every game. Yep, they coded all the number of touches, fist bumps, high fives, chest bumps, hugs. Oh, my God. They coded all of the all <laughs> of the games and looked at which, like at the beginning and at the end, which teams were performing the best. Did they, so before they started this, did they hypothesise the physical touch? Is that why they were tracking Yeah, it? so their, their hypothesis was that physical touch would, the frequency of physical touch would would increase trust and cooperation and trust and cooperation would then lead to high performance. So that's why they were tracking it, yeah. Yeah, so so they coded all the behaviours and at the end of the season it was unequivocal that the higher number of physical touches in a game 
led to higher performance ultimately through some other variables, but ultimately led to a greater performance of the team at the end of the season. Fascinating. And I think like this is for all the, the basketball people out there. Um, the you and Ryan both leaning in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm basically the, horizontal. <laughs> <laughs> the players that recorded the highest number of touches, um, I don't, I can't remember all their names, but the one that I knew, and so I'm going to report this one, um, was Kobe Bryant. Mm. So he was one of the most highly a celebratory touch, physical touch players Toucher in that season. Or touchy, he touched the most. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know actually. Okay. I think it yeah. was touch. Making the celebration, yeah, which yeah. could be, which could be partly because he's on court a lot, like he's yeah. doing a lot of playing a lot of minutes, yes. but also, yeah, I'm sure that's not the only reason, yeah. yeah. And I do want to emphasise that they did also take into account any confounding variables, so they controlled for confounding variables, such as the fact that he had so much to celebrate because he scored so much. True. For example, like <laughs> he was always yeah. scoring. Yeah, yeah. But the first thing I thought yes. was like. The team that won, they had some. They they would have out. They would have outscored every other team. So yep. So they obviously they controlled for, for all of these variables mm. and looked at the, the their um like their performance at the beginning of the season too. So basically, what they did was they could really pull out from this data the fact that when we are celebrating and celebrating through physical touch, this increases trust and cooperation. And we therefore have a much greater likelihood of performing really well as a team, which I think is pretty interesting. It's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it would be really interesting to know. Obviously, we, we, we can't now, but it would be really interesting to know if he knew that, if mm-hmm. he had any insight or ad- advice, if he, if he knew that in, in, at all. Don't think, he, I don't think he would have because then that would ruin the, no, the he, research, wouldn't it? I don't or think no, he knew. No, no not, not that they told him about it, oh. but if he just knew as a leader – if he was like, you know what, I feel like this really helps teamwork or whatever. Mm-hmm. If he was consciously making an effort to be more like physical and, you know, mm. who knows. But yeah. But I think that kind of, you know, like when you think about the times when you've kind of achieved something mm. and it's interesting you guys actually mentioned it, that at the end of your show you want to hug each yeah. other. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a group hug, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. interestingly I find that if I, before the show, if I'm not feeling like I'm quite in it and I need to get in the zone – I will give you guys a hug, yeah, and try and like get physical touch, like yeah. just to, uh, and that's a way I get into mm-hmm. a good, better place. Mm-hmm. Tops off, skin on skin. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah, it's like the baby thing. Yeah, skin exactly. on skin. Yeah, yeah. 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 Amazing. I feel like that really helps, especially when you can't sleep. It's really helpful if yeah. you just lay on my chest, <laughs> <laughs> curled up in a ball. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, mm. How interesting. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it really speaks to, again, you know, there's a couple of things in there. The first is being able to celebrate together an achievement or celebrate Mm. together, even little moments um, where, you know, even if something hasn't gone well, and you'll see this obviously in a lot of sports, you know, you'll see when people are like being encouraged, like giving an encouraging tap on the head, even if, you know, something didn't go well, you know, Mm. like there's these moments Mm -hmm. where we're still present to someone else's difficulty, we're present to someone's effort. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's making me, because th- the, the, the sports example is so interesting, but does it translate to romantic couples mm-hmm. as far as like intimate touch or just like just day-to-day intimacy? Because, you know, some couples are more touchy-feely than mm-hmm. other couples, mm-hmm. but I, has there been any research or does it translate? Yeah, look, I'm sure there definitely is, but I... I've got to be honest, I don't actually okay. know the mm. specifics. My hunch you know, is... she's all about basketball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my area of expertise. Um, my hunch is that, that that would probably be a predictor of trust and cooperation mm-hmm. mm. um, in, you know, in the same vein. Mm. Um, and, you know, of course there's going to be individual differences yeah. and, you know, you may know people that are a little bit more standoffish, mm. but that doesn't make them less, um, yeah. you know, less connected. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But in there, like, again, kind of looking at where do we show up to other people's experiences, whether they are successes or whether they're struggles. Mm-hmm. There's, so does, does, so again, the book, The Courage to be Disliked mm. comes to mind, which is, which for anyone who's read it will know that it's, it, a lot of it comes from the like theories, ideas from Alfred Adler. Mm-hmm. Um, he talks about community feeling. And so this idea of 
um, the goal is not for me to be happy. The goal is not for you to be happy, but the goal is for us to be happy Mm -hmm. and to be constantly checking in with everyone to be making, to be making sure that we're all happy, whether it be as a couple or as a family or as a basketball team or as a planet. And, and, and that feels like it kind of crosses over. Absolutely. Yeah. And interestingly in, in the same book, actually Adler makes, there's this kind of statement in there that, all problems, all personal problems are interpersonal problems. Yeah, all problems mm. are interpersonal yeah, problems, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. 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 So everything every any problem you have stems from some sort of relationship mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, or mm. person. Yeah. yeah. Which again, you know, we can see coming back to this concept that Peterson proposes is that, you know, really our well being is dependent upon other people mm. and our relationship with them. Mm. Yeah. That's on the sports example, I was just reflecting back to like I played a lot of cricket for a long time. All right, mate. And quite a, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say I was at a particularly high level. But, um, <laughs> that's it. That's all I want to say. <laughs> um, when someone takes a wicket in cricket, and this is something that I, I can't help but think about when we're talking about this, is that like you all run in together, in my case, 11 men on a team, and we all hug each other. Like it's just all these 11 men just hugging. Yeah quite intimately and making lots of noise because we're cheering. And that's what I like. And it's lovely. (laughs) And I remember how often... (laughs) Do you need a moment? (laughs) (laughs) But I remember how often I'd be in this middle of this pile of 11 men all hugging and and making weird noises. Not weird noises, like celebratory noises. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Woo! Appropriate noises. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, that's the noise, yeah. Yeah. Um, Great job, mate. Good wicket. Yeah, things like that. Yeah, great wicket you just got. Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll say stuff like that. Good catch, mate. Yeah, things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sweet LBW. Yes, yeah. another good example. Yeah. Of what we might say it's covering all bases. <laughs> um, good slips catch. Yeah. Any other modes of dismissal you want to go through? <laughs> great court and bold. Yeah, great C and B. Anyway, it's just like a mo- something good's happened, and so often in life when things good happen, you just go, oh, "That's a good thing that happened." But when you're playing sport or when you're playing cricket in that example, that's like it's we all just run around hugging yeah. and making silly noises mm. and it's lovely. Yep. Like the physical touch mm. and the celebration all happen. And you can take 10 weeks, happen 10 times in an afternoon. And it is about celebrating someone else because it, at the end of the day, if the game is won, and so let's say you've pretty much already won or, it's, or you're going to win easily or the other team have already won, but you're still out there for whatever reason bowling. If you get a wicket, there's no real celebration. Because it's everyone's about like, well, this, the game's over, so this is not exciting. Mm-hmm. It's just like when it's about the team, lots of cuddles. Can you think of in the different, and for Josh as well, like mm-hmm. in the different cricket teams you've been on with different groups of guys, were there certain teams that had more physical touch that you think were more like better teams? We were definitely, yeah. it was just like if you're much closer as a group as people. You, you were more successful as a team, do you think? Uh, I can't, I can't remember mm-hmm. that. Necessarily, it's just like it was an indication of how close. Yeah, you I remember were it friends. being more enjoyable yeah. playing there, and mm-hmm. my sense is that if you're having fun, we're probably being more successful too. Yeah, which really kind of reinforces the research there yeah. too. Yeah, you know that the closer you are, the more trust, the more cooperation, the more touch, the more celebration, the better mm-hmm. the yeah. performance. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I guess if we're looking at some other aspects that are related to this kind of particular concept, um, another one of I guess the maybe the aspects of living that that Peterson um, suggests is really related to this idea of other people matter is the idea of the family meal. Mm. And this doesn't have to be specific to parents and children, but it can be this concept of the community or the like communal meal that we share. Mm-hmm. And there were some stats that were done probably about 10 years ago. I don't have the ones for Australia, but but in the States it was something like, 40 to 50% of Americans don't eat dinner together as families, mm. um, which is like it's a really yeah. high mm. number. So basically like 50% of families are not eating dinner together. There's, there's just sorry to just, there's a great documentary called The Queen of Versailles, which is brilliant doco about the, I think it's sort of, sort of loosely about the, I think the housing crisis or the global fund. So there was some sort of financial crisis that it was set around, essentially about one of the richest families in America. He was one of the owners or founders of timeshare properties, I guess. And it was about his wife and their family and they had all these kids. And in the middle of built, the documentary when it starts is about them building the biggest house in America. 
And then when the financial crisis hits, they lose all this money and they have to, uh, they had like, I think seven children and they had to fire six of the seven nannies that they had to look after all the kids. And so this, the, the, the wife of the guy who was like living this luxurious life and, you know, had like a room full of things that they've bought and didn't want anymore. So they just put it in this room. This is like insane, disgusting um, luxury. And point the reason I bring it up is because when this happens and all the nannies are gone and all of a sudden she's in, she has to now look after all these children, there's this scene where she she gets the family to sit around the table and have dinner, which they'd never done. And so she's like, all right, we are going to have a uh, a, a meal. We're going to have dinner together. And the kids are like baffled. <laughs> she's like, we're going to do it like they do it on television. And so like the kids are setting the table, but they're like, what is this bizarre thing? Like they had no, <laughs> the, the point is, is that like th- they grow closer together without all the money and it becomes actually mm. this sort of binding thing. But mm. anyway, that was just sort of an interesting thing that we probably cut out. Cheers. Oh, no, I think that I... <laughs> 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 My confidence in that just declined. <laughs> really? <laughs> at, at oh, the I was end. really enjoying that. Thank you. Yeah. Shit, 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 shit. <laughs> no, I think that I think that was a very high note. <laughs> <laughs> was so really high. Yeah, the higher it is, the less I trust it. <laughs> so I've known you for a long time. It's the highest <laughs> note I've ever heard you say. <laughs> Are you sure the spaghetti's okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's good. It's fine. <laughs> uh, um, that is a very relevant example. Okay. Um, right. Because, like, we see it obviously in in TV shows and things around this side, like mm. this notion of the family dinner. But it's there for a reason um, because it's not about what we're eating. It's never really about the particular food per se that we're eating. But it's about this ritual of coming together to see each other. And the research, again, is really unequivocal when it comes to the benefits of eating together as a family and, you know, gosh, I really want to acknowledge the difficulties of, of eating with little kids. Like, you know, this is not always a very yeah. a pleasurable experience. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, the but, least pleasurable thing you could do. <laughs> yep. In your wow. Day. <laughs> That's a big statement. We are now entering negative psychology. <laughs> <laughs> the less talked about form. <laughs> but if we can kind of sit with what's the long-term gain here, um, and that is we know that the research says, first of all, that that families that are eating together more often and usually are healthier. Um, so there's lots of reasons for that. If you think about the alternative to eating together with a, with a family, it's often you might be eating in front of a TV, hypothetically. And when you're eating kind of mindlessly, we also tend to eat more and eat things that aren't necessarily as good for us. Mm. So that, there's that aspect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's really fundamentally this moment of coming together to see each other. And maybe we see each other in a way where someone's really struggling or maybe we see that this is a really, really difficult moment to be here with one another. Mm -hmm. But the alternative is avoidance. And so if we've got like basically we've got avoidance of discomfort or we've got discomfort with the view of this being in the direction I would like our family to head in. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm just kind of really acknowledging the little kid scenario here. Mm -hmm. But I'm also acknowledging the scenario where you have adolescent children and maybe there's no talking or maybe there's grunting or maybe there's disagreement and conflict at the table. Well, the ultimate thing to to acknowledge from mine is that many families battle with someone with an eating disorder around the table and that is a nightmare. Yeah, and that's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do really want to acknowledge that. So, you know, of course there are going to be some really difficult aspects to this this Mm -hmm. idea, Um, but at the heart of what we're looking at here is an an opportunity for some quality moment. And it might be quality that is hard, but it's a time in which you are present to other people's experience. We have an opportunity to ask, how is your day? And we can obviously bring in a whole lot of different kinds of questions that really kind of can bring into kind of gratitude moments, for example. Mm. But, you know, for me that this is like a tradition that we can cultivate not only with our families, but it can also be with friends. I'm just kind of thinking back even to things like, you know, if there are people listening that live in share houses, you know, do you have a family dinner once a week? Like, do you have this opportunity you know, in your share house where you all cook together or you eat together, you know, is this an opportunity that you have to kind of sit down and say like, you know, gosh, like how, like, how are you going here? I mean, I, 
I just can't help but think about this podcast. It's it's pretty amazing, actually. Like we 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 sit around a circular table and we just talk for the sake of talking <laughs> because we have a podcast. Yeah, because we're recording it. We otherwise we wouldn't just sit around like this facing each other mm. Mm. and and just talking about something so uh, consciously, like yeah. intentionally. But it's so good. Like it's I love it so mm. much. And of course, like I mean, there are times where we're so engrossed you just forget that there are microphones and cameras. Mm. Um, because it's just such a healthy thing to do. Yeah. But it's so rare mm. that you actually get to you actually get to do it. Mm. Mm-hmm. This may be a pointless side strain, but I wonder if the shape of the table matters because I feel like circular tables are so much better for conversation. Yeah. Than yeah. square. Well, it just yeah. makes me think of the Knights of the Round Table. You know that there's, <laughs> you know that there yeah, there's equal, something. Equal. Yeah, there is, yeah. and there's like a, a um, infiniteness about a circ- like a circle, mm. right? So that we're all together and there's no one that is of higher status than another. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think there could be something, you know, certainly in terms of like how you sit around a table together. There's, um, we've got this table that we sit around. It's so great grandparents, I think. And it's had like, at one point there was some ridiculous amount of people in a family that there was like 10 siblings or something. It's about the size of this. And there was at some point in time, there were family dinners happening around that table. There was, where well, there was like 11 of them squeezed Whoa. around the table. It, it feels like a, Four or five person table. Yeah. It's probably smaller than this, actually. I think it's a little yeah. bit smaller than this. Yeah. But um, I was looking at it and it's like 100 years old. It's pretty rickety. But I was looking at it last night, weirdly, and from the couch and thinking, I reckon even if we got enough money to update the dining setup, I kind of like the idea of just keeping that one yeah. <laughs> for, yeah. for our family dinners to keep awesome. the, because of the amount, the shared experience and the ricketiness of it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Well, it's yeah, funny the amount that it of pop in. the the history of it is yeah. just if you if you think about it, it's quite cool. And a small like I feel like if we were going going to get a new one, we'd end up with a big fancy mm. thing where everyone's a bit further apart, a bit yeah. nicer. There's something about this table that's a bit um, imperfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I really regret saying that. Um, <laughs> that's a, a little bit shitty, yeah. but lovely, and it's small, so we're all kind of mm. compact around this thing. Love yeah. it. That's really good. Cool. Yeah. No, I think that's beautiful. Mm. It's actually interesting. My this is a bit of a personal note, but my um, my parents are most likely about to pack up their our long standing family home, mm. um, and they're probably going to have to get rid of most of the furniture, the furniture that I kind of grew up with and things. And oh. there is something about our kitchen table, you know, for sure. Mm. Like the, it's actually interesting. Like as you're talking, the thought of that table going mm. is like this is the table where we've like shared things everything, mm. like pleasant, unpleasant. All of the things are around that table. Yeah. Um, and it just really represents, like this is like this representation of family and being connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I guess just, you know, having this moment to reflect on, you know, how often can I show up to this and how can I let, for example, how can I let my phone go or how can I let mm. work go? How can I give over 30 minutes to show up to this family? If that's the only time I get during the day, like can I be present to this even if it feels really hard? Yeah, I, I, first thing I think is, and I'm not, I'm not saying I'm good at this, but because I, I was thinking about parents going, but how do I get my teenagers to get off their phones? And I'm more thinking going back a step and just thinking for parents who have kids our age, like, you know, primary school kids who don't have a phone yet, just modelling, modelling that mm. never have your phone on the table so it mm-hmm. doesn't look like an acceptable thing to do at any point. Um, and again, I'm not perfect at that, but. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and I should say we're not perfect either. We have uh, like... I reckon it's fifty percent of the time we can get Charlie to sit there, and but otherwise he wants to have he wants to watch TV, and we're like, mm. no, can't watch TV. Or we try to hold that rule, but obviously break it a lot, as every parent seems to do with their rules. Uh, I hope, uh, but he'll he'll then take his food and want to sit at the coffee table with the hope that the TV will just come on at some point, <laughs> so he just sits there eating it, going like, who's going to break first? But it always feels like a win. Mm-hmm. So I'm not trying to project that we have, we're a family that we always sit down together and always mm-hmm. do it, but it always feels like such a win when we can get him, get us all there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's probably about 50% of the time, but it's a, it's awesome when uh-huh. it happens. I'm just kind of thinking like, you know, even as you're talking about um, the traditions of saying grace um, and, you know, I'm not a particularly spiritual person per se, but if we look at kind of what that tradition is, you know, obviously mm. it's paying thanks to God, but also this is this moment here of gratitude for us being here together to share this meal. So, mm. you know, in some ways we can also, um, 
we can also play with this idea around, you know, what's sitting under the intention of that particular tradition. There is, you know, this is for maybe this is for parents with little kids. And I don't do this all the time, but I have done it on, on occasion. There's, um, I don't know if anyone's, if you guys have seen like little meditation bowls that you kind oh, of. that you go. Yeah, they like the sound bowls. Yeah, oh, yes, I got yeah, one of them. Yeah. 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 Or you can just use an app on your phone. <clears throat> <laughs> um, I've done this a few times with my kids. Sometimes it's really helpful. Sometimes like they are away with the various. But to start, like to start a dinner, you ring the bell and you ask them, whoever doesn't hear the sound anymore, like as soon as you don't hear the sound, you put your hand up. So the the, the practice is that they are having to pay attention to the sound or to the absence of the sound. That's so good. And it's just this way of kind of starting like the entry into this meal together. Yeah. About a gong. Like a gong would be great next to the dinner table. Yeah. Like a big like gong. <laughs> and then you just need Red Simon to have dinner with you every night. <laughs> gong and Red. Yeah. Yep. But it's just this like little moment sometimes. And again, you know, like this is ideal world stuff really. But And we can play around with what kind of traditions you have at the beginning of a meal. But And maybe it is even something like what, you know, what went well today, you know, kind of really utilising that gratitude practice. Mm. Um, but where are these moments to pause to kind of really see each other here mm-hmm. right now? I love it. That's really cool. The gong is great. <laughs> the gong would be great. It'd be so dramatic. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> a gong to kick off the meal. It'd be great. It's a great idea though. Just that any, any kind of tradition around family moments is such a, because mm. they'll be talking about it in 20 years time. I remember we had to listen to that. Dad used to ring that bowl thing. We had to like so, <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> Telling their friends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my dad had a gong. <laughs> I think I told you guys this, but just on the practice of gratitude at dinner time, we did. We were away with Penny's parents for the whole summer holidays, like five weeks, and, and the kids and everything. And so, because we we're all together, all sitting around the table every single night, wasn't around one, but we would. I would every single night. I was like, every. I'm going to say what everyone's going to say. What your favorite thing was. And so I would start with the grandparents and then Penny and I would do it, then the kids would do it. And Benji, who was five at the time, um, didn't love it all the time, but he listened. Like he always listened. This is a message people going, my kids wouldn't do that gratitude mm. stuff. He didn't participate all the time. He, he was present for it and it was modelled to him for, it was like five weeks in a row. And then on the last day, I had to, so I had to come back um, home early for work. And so on my last day down at the beach house, it was raining. It was the first time it rained in five weeks and I was so shattered about it. And I kept saying, I can't believe my last day it's raining. I don't get to go to the beach with you guys. I'm so sad. And I was sitting next to Benji and he said, hey, daddy. And I said, yes, this is after I'd complained about the weather. And he said, um, he said, it's raining, it's pouring, the old man is snoring, but he's happy because his water tank is full. <laughs> I said, wow. I said, I beg your pardon. That <laughs> is not how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> we I do said, things oh. right in this house. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, say that again. And he said, you heard me. <laughs> oh, my God. That's great. Yeah, amazing. Oh, Just like the, the yeah. most profound, yeah. deeply profound moment in gratitude. Yeah. I oh. couldn't quite believe it. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. That he's been noticing. We I really kind so, of paying yeah. attention yeah. to that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, that was the ultimate gratitude thing. Absolutely. And this is, you know, really kind of when we're looking at gratitude, this is a fundamental aspect of other people matter, you Mm. know, the expression of gratitude, the experience of feeling grateful. So it's bi-directional, right? So it's for the receiver, but also for the person that's giving Mm. the, like, you know, saying the gratitude. Mm. So it's an absolutely fundamental part to other people matter. It's such a, I mean, for me, it's the, the impact it's had on me in the small amount I know about it, um, is for so long it's it's so easy to get caught up in your own stuff or your own like work or your you know how you're acting at a certain place or wanting you know wanting to impress people or wanting to get praise for certain things at work or at home or whatever um but that is something that you often can't control how people will feel about you how people will feel about what you do but the thing that I've that sort of helped me re realign how I look at everything is with other people matter is thinking about it in terms of how can I, instead of focusing on how I am loved, focusing, focus on how I can be loving mm. to other people. And, and the, 
especially with with jam, especially in my relationship. And it's in this sort of constant struggle that I have with prioritizing my relationship more than I prioritize my work, my work because I now know that if I have a good relationship, everything else will be better. Mm. But that has to be the for me that that from what I know of this other people matter and that has to be the first domino to fall. Like I feel like if you've and not maybe not your relationship, maybe like your friends or your family or all of them, but for for me it's really helped to kind of keep reminding myself focus on other people, focus on my relationships and like prioritize that, try and show people how much I love them rather than just assuming that they know. I think that that's been oh, a really big so change. so spot on mm. is the assumption that they know. Mm. Yeah. 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 Because, because well, for me, my, my whole upbringing is that I was very lucky in my family is that I, I, I knew that my parents loved me. I assumed that they did. They didn't need to do outlandish things to, to show me. I didn't need to do outlandish things to show that it was just this assumed thing that I was loved and supported and, you know, so, so lucky that I got dropped into that house. Um, but, but a lot of people don't have that. But so for me, so that, so for me, because I had that, uh, I've sort of grown up with the assumption that I don't need to show love mm. because it's assumed. And that's been a big thing with, with Jam and I is that, I often don't do, uh, I don't organize things or think about ways in which I can sh- prove to Jam or show Jam that I love her because I'm, I just think, well, you know, I love you. So I don't, why do I need to organize a big special day? Because you know, I love you. Why do you need that? But she, cause she's all about ceremony and she loves events and she, she does so much for me and organizes so many things to show me how she loves me. But it's just not in my – my default position is not to do that. So I've had to – I have to now work really hard to keep reminding myself that that is important. It's important to show her that I love her and to show my family that I love them And because if I don't consciously choose to do it, I just won't do it. Mm. But I know now – I know intellectually that it's so important and by doing that, it will ultimately make me a happier person. Oh, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. And there, okay. there's two really important parts, and that is, you know, really undermining this assumption. Um, and I, like, I do want to acknowledge, you know, that 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 the assumption that I'm loved is, you know, is such a wonderful thing, really. You know, to to be in a family, to mm. know implicitly without the words being spoken that I'm loved. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, you know, that's you know mm. pretty amazing. Um, but when we step outside of the family too, we can also see where um, we need to to work with that assumption around even like friendships. So. Mm-hmm. You know, our friends come from different families. Our friends come from different or have different attachment styles, different personal histories where they don't know that I love them. So, mm-hmm. you know, we can even see how that moves into friendships too around showing up to other people to show that we love them. Um, yeah. You know, being able to explicit, be explicit about my love for my friends mm. um, or the people that are outside of that family of origin where maybe it's not necessary to be so explicit. And and what, another thing I'll say on it is the the person in my life who 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 does who has done this the entire, entire time I've known him is Hamish. Hamish is incredible. You would know this, Hugh, but he's a love bandit. He is a love <laughs> bandit. <laughs> he is. It's it's this is it is in it is in his default. Mm. But he the way he shows love for his friends and family is unlike really anyone mm-hmm. I've ever met. It's quite extraordinary. Yeah, it really is. The the memories he creates for not only like his friends, but his kids and his wife and it's it's quite it's quite it's, it's quite extraordinary. Yeah. Mm, and yeah. I can hear like I can even hear in you in you saying that there's this kind of sense of feeling inspired. So much. Mm. And and often like I feel bad. Like often I'm like I'm not doing I'm a bad friend because I'm not doing as much <laughs> as much as he is because he's He's always organizing incredible things mm-hmm. and and creating great memories and experiences for people and and he's done that for me for such a long time and so many of our friends and uh, it, it's it is very inspiring and I think only recently now learning about other people matter do I realize how important that has mm-hmm. been and how powerful that actually has been just to get specific on the definition of other people matter there there seems to be multiple ways you can interpret that that phrase 
as far as the other people connection and the connection with other people matter or the sheer fact that another person matters. Um, I find that I, uh, uh, I'm often questioning or thinking about why my general well-being has increased so much in the last few years from what it used to be. And I really think the key, one of the key factors is that my kind of like my epicenter of care and concern has sort of moved away from me to my children. And I think, and it's interesting hearing this, that that just the sheer fact that I care more about them really than myself uh, would, it sounds like that's going to have a general increase Mm. in wellbeing because it certainly has been the experience for me personally, but it sounds like it sort of maps onto the research. Oh, absolutely. And so the way in which, you know, you're reaching out you know, outwards to shop to care for your family, for example. Yeah, yeah. has increased my well-being. Yeah, and I think that's family. also really tied into meaning and purpose. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, if we're looking again at a positive psychology with a positive psychology lens, um, there are. This is broadly speaking. There is more to this than what I'm about to say, but there are these kind of two kinds of happiness or well-being, and one's hedonic happiness, mm. and one's eudaimonic happiness. And hedonic happiness comes from you know black. Like, the um, the pleasurable experiences, yeah. you know, being able to experience, you know, a beautiful dinner or a beautiful view or, you know, like very like, and again, coming back to this like hedonistic kind of experience of pleasure. Mm. Things you do for yourself. Yeah, in some ways. And they, they certainly can be in relation to other people, definitely. Mm. Um, but they're more transitory states. Um, yeah. But eudaimonic happiness or eudaimonic um, approach to happiness is, is around meaning and purpose. Um, and we actually kind of know to have um, like a, a more broad experience of well-being, resilience, um, enjoyment, life satisfaction that we need to address both of those parts of our lives. Would yeah, it be, okay. would it be yeah. the, as an example of the different versions of that, would one be going out for a really nice meal with friends versus inviting friends over and making a really nice meal for people, like kind of giving people an experience. Is yeah, that could be in. Yeah, that, that would be a you don't was it you demonic you demonic. Yep. Mm, okay. Um, th- the interesting thing about I didn't, I won't go too much into this because it is quite there's quite a lot of stuff in here. But the interesting thing about eudaimonia, which is not about pleasure, and that is so relevant for parenting. And I and I'm I'm sorry if, if this is excluding people that are not parents. But when we think about raising children, there's often big increase in eudaimonia in raising children, but it's not necessarily moments of happiness. Yeah, okay. So there's a hard work in the raising of the children or being with the children. And in those moments, you may not say that I'm feeling really, really happy, but there's a big connection there to meaning and purpose, which in the longer term really leads us down this pathway of having a life that is worth living. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, it does. Because I reckon a lot of parents, if you called them at the time, they'd go like, I'm having the worst fucking day ever. But would just have a, for me, I have more extreme moments of like, this is so overwhelming, I can't handle it. But my overwhelming sense of happiness is infinitely greater than it mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. five years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that, is that, is that kind of, for, for a non-parent example, is that kind of like if you go through any sort of really, really tough project that in the moment is like, this yeah. is so hard. Yeah. But then you remember it fondly. Yeah, I, I still. Yeah, or I imagine people who are like, when there's like, uh, for some reason I've got this in, in image of my head of like an architect or something. But like people who are working really hard on a project together, and they're doing like heaps of really late nights and working really hard, probably are complaining a lot. But there'd be, I feel like when you're on that momentum and you're achieving stuff, there's also this kind of feeling of really good feeling that comes along with it, mm-hmm. even if you're very stressed throughout mm. it. Absolutely. And this is about kind of this, again, this cultivation of of a rich and meaningful life as opposed and distinct from um, the pursuit of happiness. Because like I mentioned before, it is it is only a state, a transitory state. And if we're chasing happiness constantly, that comes at a huge cost. Mm-hmm. Um, from a therapeutic point of view, if we are so averse to the other side of happiness – So like all of the unpleasant emotions, if we can't be with those emotions, that's hugely problematic. So the pursuit, um, and there's a, um, there's a great book by Russ Harris called The Happiness Trap, which really kind of will go into detail around the, um, the, the problems. 
and traps of only wanting to feel this one emotion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And positive mm-hmm. psychology is not about that. You know, yeah. it's really kind of a much more broad concept around how do we promote flourishing, vitality, connection, all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Wow. And there's one other kind of aspect I just really wanted to kind of bring Please. in towards the mm-hmm. end, um, which is actually something that Brene Brown talks about. It's actually, She talks about it in, in the last podcast she did. I think it might have been at the end of last year maybe. And it was really around a question of do you think people in general are doing the best they can? And it got me, and in this episode, I would encourage people to have a listen. It's really great and she's, she's such a good storyteller. Um, but it's really bringing into question, you know, whether we believe that people are doing the best they can and how that kind of the answer to that impacts upon your sense of well-being. Mm. So, for example, like if we kind of think about this capacity to see the good in people. So if we if we can see that someone may have done something that's, um, you know, maybe not okay for us, you know, that can feel obviously really aversive and it can trigger us to feel, you know, very angry and resentful and bitter and a whole lot of, a whole lot of sorts of things. But if we have this capacity to stand back and to really question like, oh, what, you know, what might be going on for them? Maybe this is the best that they are doing. Like, maybe this is the best that they can do at the moment. Mm. Is there some change for us in holding that view of mm. humanity as opposed to the view that they're not doing the best they can? I have a wonderful example from this. I'm so happy to mention this person. He doesn't listen to our podcast. There's no way of his name's Chris. I've played cricket with him for a long time, Chris Grant. Yep. Uh, and he once, we were playing against the side, and there was a guy who had been batting for quite a while, trying his hardest, and after a while people were getting frustrated, so someone sledged him. And uh, Chris, who's on our team, who he was on the same team as the person sledging, he went, Oi, never have a crack at a bloke having a crack. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what a wonderful saying yeah. for life. Never had a crack at someone having a Absolutely. crack. Absolutely. The thing I think about, uh, and I'm sure it's like chicken and the egg thing mm. with the two, with a lot of stuff actually, but um, I feel like when I'm having a bad day and someone wrongs me in the inverted commas, like traffic or whatever, I don't see that. And I automatically go to worst possible interpretation of the behavior. Mm. But if I'm in a really good place and things are going well, I'm much quicker and much easier to grasp. Are oh, they, you know, they're not a bad person. They're doing mm. the best they mm-hmm. can on mm. this day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I find that the fact that if you can hold on to that yeah. perspective yeah. would change your well-being made so much sense to me because I feel like I can view it from the other angle that I can only access those states depending on what day I'm having. Yeah. So yeah. it's mood dependent or state dependent. Yeah, whether yeah. I can – and I can sort of be f- get there, but it's a, the, the immediate reaction mm. to someone's mm-hmm. behaviour. Yeah, um, it's more. It's a much more effortful state. Um, to be and, like they're just doing their best, yeah, the best they can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm not saying – and I really want to be clear that I'm not saying that we want to be excusing behaviour mm. and I'm not saying that we want to have no boundaries because I think that's really important, but can we compassionately hold boundaries, of course. Yeah. Um, but just kind of looking at the cost of always thinking, like people can be doing better. Like, mm-hmm. you know, what's the cost yeah. for you yeah. if you always think like that person's not trying hard enough or like they could have done better on that? You know, mm. what often happens, and Brene Brown talks about this, is that the people that that unequivocally believe that people are not doing the best they can is tied so significantly to perfectionism. So mm. the, the, those people that will be more judgmental of others are equally really ju- very judgmental of their own performance mm. too. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Mm. So, and the people that believe kind of more generally and in a reflective kind of way that people are generally doing the best they can, are less likely to be perfectionistic. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, there's no point in me explaining this, but I think maybe something worth putting in the show notes is a, it's a speech by David Foster Wallace called, I think it's called This Is Water. Um, and I think it's, it, the first time I heard it, it made me cry and I probably would if I listened to it again, but it's this amazing speech that I think is very relevant to what we're talking mm-hmm. about. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not sure if there's worth me even explaining it because I'll butcher it. Uh-huh. But it's very much about what you're talking about. Yeah, we'll try right. and find a link yeah. to it maybe. Yeah. Yeah, mm. there's heaps online. I think it's been like animated and okay. turned into many things. It'd be good but. content if we could get you crying. 
Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'd be okay. great, actually. All right, I'll do the speech. <laughs> I'll read it. Just do a pickup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just on that is that, and, you know, I don't want to... I don't mean to be like the Alfred Adler fanboy, but the his the other thing he says is to have confidence in people. Mm. Is that that sounds like similar to the idea of sort of assuming people are doing the best they can? Yeah, it's like assuming the good in people. Yes, yeah, assuming and so seeing like seeing the good in people. I think Ben Crow talked about this briefly in one of his episodes this year. Anyway, mm-hmm. I think he did. And yeah. so we um, the thing is we have a choice around that. We really do, and I and I it takes some intentional action here, but we have a choice around how, like what we see in people, you know, being wise about it, of course, but we have this choice. And if we choose to see the good in people, there is an implicit effect that that has on our sense of well-being and belief in humanity too. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I feel yeah. like it does make a massive difference when you, because like often when you see someone, you know, that experience of I don't know if this is the same, but it reminds me of it. When you walk past someone or you see someone somewhere and they look grumpy or angry and you just you make a judgment based on how their face is and their body is that, oh, they're an angry person. Mm. And then for whatever reason you like, you know, you might like smile at them or test the you know, test them and see if you can get them to smile. And then they'll completely change and become like this very kind mm. of give you this very happy smile, like, oh, morning. And I'm like, oh wow, he's that that guy, I, I could have written that guy off as this angry person who I have nothing, to, I, I cannot connect with that guy. But then I just gave him a little smile and then I tr- maybe trusted that he would smile back or hope that he would smile back and then he did. And so I think they're the moments where I, it kind of does remind me that, oh yeah, he's a, he's just a guy trying to get through the day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. In- and isn't it so interesting that you remember that? Yeah. Like there's that moment there of connection Definitely. and it's and it's been kind of embedded in your experience of people. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Sorry, Hugh, you were going to say no, something? No, no, I'm glad you said it then because I was just going to say I think we should go over the key mm-hmm. points from today. Mm. So I think there was like three or four sort of main Yeah, look, key and things, so. there, are, there are lots, there's a lot more to this I really want to be clear and this is just yeah, like a snippet yeah. to, to understanding this, this kind of principle of other people matter. Yeah. Um, and so the things that we've spoken about is celebration. Yeah. Um, so really being able to show up to other people's celebrations, but also your own and maybe thinking about, you know, like even kind of physical touch and how you show up in that, in that space. Mm. Um, we've spoken about the family meal mm. and rituals around kind of connection and togetherness. And that family meal obviously doesn't need to be taken literally in yeah, family, yeah. it could be work or it could be any sort of group. Friend Absolutely. Yeah. Friends, yeah, you know, yeah. any kind of moment where we're really pausing to be with each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Nice. Um, and it kind of implicit or a part of that is, you know, the experience of gratitude. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously that's a really big topic, which we, we haven't really gone into today. And then I guess the last thing was really around kind of this meaning and purpose discussion, mm. but that it's always the meaning and purpose in some ways is always really connected to how we're relating to other people. Other people. Yeah. 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 Mm. That they matter. Yep. Mm. Yep, seeing, yep. Seeing the good in other people. Yeah. Seeing the good in other people. But yeah. Believing people have their, uh, are trying their hardest. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Love, it's a really nice way to, yeah. I can think of a few examples of when I felt disappointed by someone, something they've done. And then, but if you think they're trying their hardest, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great. Right, mm-hmm. Good on them. Yeah. And again, you know, I want to be clear with that last point that it's not about excusing. Um, mm, unhealthy bad or bad behaviour, yeah, 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 but around, you know, how we relate to that experience whilst being able to put in kind of boundaries around that too. Yeah, that's true. There is just one very last thing, and I feel like it really exemplifies exactly what we've been talking about today. A little bit of a b- b- bonus moment. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Unexpected. Um, there was a, or there is a, um, a hospice chaplain called Kerry Egan, and she's written a book and she reflects upon her time in going into hospice, hospices working with the dying. And she talks in there about the fact that although she's a chaplain, very few people are wanting to talk about God in their dying moments. They're not asking for spiritual guidance in those moments. She reflects that what we talk about are relationships mm-hmm. and mm. what we talk about are families. Mm. And so at the end of the day, from birth to death, according to Chris Peterson, other people matter. Mic drop. I'm glad you <laughs> glad you did that finish. <laughs> Goodbye. <Bye. laughs>
Thanks for joining us, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. M. Oh, it's a Amazing. pleasure. Amazing. <laughs> Ciao. The Imperfects is hosted and produced by Hugh Van Kylenberg, Ryan Shelton, and Josh Van Kylenberg. Our executive producer is Bridget Northeast. This episode was filmed by Andy Poole and edited by Jamison Moore. <laughs>